Hi, my name's Trevor, and it's my real privilege to bring you God's word today. There's something rather wonderful about being around a master craftsman at his work. You may have watched the repair shop on TV in which skilled craftsmen bring to life something that's a bit old and jaded or broken. And imagine if you're with someone like that for a minute, who's extremely practiced and skilled at what they're doing. What reactions or emotions arise as you watch them? You might be in awe because they can do something that you obviously can't. Yet at the same time, there might be some kind of longing that if, oh, what would it be like if I could do that as well? What would it be like to be an apprentice to that person, to sit with them day after day, gleaning everything you can from them and growing in that skill? But if you're like me, even as you dream, you may be aware of nagging doubts. Would I ever really be able to do this? Do I have that basic skill set, the hand-eye coordination, a steady enough hand? Do I even have the patience for this? Sitting at a desk, painstaking work, no shortcuts allowed. And do I have enough years left in me to learn this skill? So fundamentally, do I actually have what it takes? When one of Jesus' disciples, one of his apprentices, asks him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples, he was asking for a master class from the master himself. I wonder what the disciple was expecting. I suppose today we might have been expecting a, a training course with online modules and video content. Or in the old days, we might have been carrying a heavy pile of manuals home. But instead, Jesus just gives us a few sentences. Of course, he's providing us a framework, a scaffold from which we can build our own specific prayers about specific situations. And Jesus did teach elsewhere in the Gospels. And I dare say he taught, taught them on prayer when, when it wasn't recorded. But I'm sure that the most impact on their lives as they traveled around with him was just to see him day by day going off, praying, being in his presence. Lord, teach us to pray. Yes, indeed. Help fill the gap between my prayer life and yours, Lord. And help fill the gap be between my desire to pray and what I actually manage to do. So here's the question. Are we moving forward in prayer? Do you see progress in your own life? Are you putting things in place to help your prayer life? And as a church here at Encounter Vineyard, are we moving forward in prayer in line with our vision and mission? We're hoping that this series on the Lord's Prayer will help us move forward. And today it's part three. In week one, we saw that we can relate to God as our Father in a personal way. And how as his children, we can run back to him time and time again. In week two, we saw that in the uncertainties of life, the what-ifs of life, God is the one who is in control. And when we pray, your kingdom come, your will be done, it's a prayer of surrender. We're waving that white flag, your will be done. 
Today, we're looking at give us this day our daily bread. And in doing so, we've moved into the second half of the prayer, where in the next three verses, the focus switches to our needs. Tim Chester, who's written a very helpful book entitled You Can Pray, neatly summarizes each verse like this. Our verse for today, verse 11, is for our provision, our daily bread. Verse 12 is for our pardon, our forgiveness. And verse 13 is for our protection from temptation and from evil or the evil one. Provision, pardon, and protection. And it struck me that each point, the evil one would like to knock us off course as the thief to steal our trust in our Father's provision, as the accuser to undermine our assurance of forgiveness, and as the tempter to tempt us to evil. That's why we pray to be delivered from the evil one. But these three verses which focus on our needs are each built on the solid foundation of the first two verses. The beginning of the prayer should be our first concern, first things first. Firstly, the Father heart of God. We need that truth of his love and care to sink deep into our souls. And secondly, the desire for his kingdom above all things. For that to take center stage in our hearts, in your mind will, and emotion. And when we pray the Lord's Prayer, we're praying our in the plural. It's a collective prayer to be prayed by a community of believers. We all share the same Father. We're all adopted into the same family. But it recently, it struck me that Jesus himself is included in praying our. It's not just us praying, he's praying with us. This is a great comfort and encouragement, is it not? Today, when we pray, he's alongside us, he's in the midst of us, his spirit is helping us to pray in our weakness. The master hasn't left us alone to struggle in prayer in our own strength. And equally, I think Jesus was including himself in praying our when he was walking on this earth with his disciples. It was not, not, not just for his disciples to pray this prayer, he was praying alongside them. Okay, he might not needed to have personally prayed, forgive my sins, but the rest of the prayer was as relevant to him as to his disciples. And that's why he gives them this particular prayer. He has already proved this way of kingdom praying in his own life, and now he's sharing it with them. So what did Jesus mean when he prayed, give us this day our daily bread? What was he asking for from his Father in heaven? And when it comes to praying for our needs, for our daily bread, what can we learn from his example? I'm going to keep the focus on Jesus and see what we can learn from the master himself. Let's open three windows through which to observe Jesus. First, he trusted his father in heaven to provide his material needs for life. Secondly, he nourished and strengthened his spirit by the word of God. And thirdly, he found greatest satisfaction in fulfilling his kingdom purpose. Each of these things were his daily bread. So the first one, Jesus trusted his Father in heaven to provide his material needs for life. He was absolutely confident 
that his Father in heaven would provide his needs and those of his companions from day to day and into the future. Jesus knew that his God, his Father, was both willing and able to meet his needs. Do we know this? His trust in his heavenly Father was so confident, so assured, that he could rest in God's love and goodness and care for him. Even for his most practical and material needs. So how did Jesus convey this trust to us? Well, first of all, he exhorts us, he encourages us to consider the Father's provision for his creation and all his creatures. Do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more of more value? Than they. So if the Father looks after and feeds the birds and they go about their daily business without a care for the future, how could he possibly fail to look after you who are worth so much more to him? Are you not of more value than they, Jesus says. And a few verses on, he says, if he clothes the flowers, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? And he concludes by saying, your heavenly Father knows you need all these things, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. What are all these things? Not only food, drink and clothing, but all the things you need for life. Five times he mentions the word anxious in this short passage. And that's because he's targeting our natural anxiety. Am I going to have enough? Am I going to be all right? Anxiety is a big and growing issue in today's world, especially in these uncertain times. It's impacting our young people. It's impacting our friends and family, and it's impacting us. But Jesus is clear on this point. The antidote to anxiety is trust in your heavenly Father who sees you, who values you, who knows what you need, in every season of your life and in every transition from one phase of life to another. He understands what you need and when you need it. He sees you. He values you more than many birds or sparrows. Your worth in his eyes is so great that he sent his only son to live and die for you, to show us the Father's love and how we should relate to him. As Mark said in part one, amazing this, that your fa the Father loves you as much as he loves Jesus, his son. Next, Jesus encourages us to consider the Father's giving and generous nature. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent. If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts 
to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? So if every day mums and dads love their children and give good things, how much more will our gracious Father, the maker of all things, Give us good things. If you ask him for something good, a loaf, he's not going to trick you and give you something superficially similar, like a stone. Or if you ask for something healthy, like a fish, he won't give you something harmful instead, a serpent. It's ridiculous. Are you expecting good things from God today? Do you believe this? We may doubt him. We may think that our God does not really love me, that he's withholding from me. That's actually part of being human. Ever since Adam and Eve in the garden felt that God was withholding goodness from them, we've had the same battle. There may be particular reasons, experiences, why you find it hard to trust God. You may feel let down, disappointed in some way. You may feel that he can love everyone but me, that I don't deserve to be loved. But Jesus is reassuring us that his father loves all his children. And it's not performance related. Your employer might measure your performance and measure your worth by how well you're doing at work. Even your family members may have judged you on your past performance. But the kingdom of God is different. The father loves you in spite of your performance. You know, the sparrow gets on with the business of daily living without anxiety. It unconsciously trusts in its maker. We don't have that luxury. We must consciously trust him. And that's a challenge. But the truth is our father is gracious. He wants to meet our needs. He's willing to meet our needs. And he's also sovereign. He can meet our needs. He is able. In today's, today's economic system, with all its complexity and uncertainty, our Father God still has all the resources to meet your needs. Philippians 4, 19, and my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. We talk about supply and demand, don't we? Take the housing market. If there are fewer homes on the market, the supply is low. Therefore, there is competition for that scarce resource. The demand is high and inevitably the prices go up. But with God, the supply side is infinite. He does not lack resources to meet our needs. That may be difficult to believe when we see scarcity on our TV screens or experience it in our own lives. But fundamentally, we must receive this truth by faith in childlike trust, like a child expecting their father to bless them. It's a truth we must learn to inhabit and not just acknowledge in our minds because that won't cut it. For every need, God is your source. He is the supply. It's not your employer who is ultimately your source. It's not your spouse or your pension, or your benefits. Those things are simply the channel down which your provision flows. 
But God, your Father, is at the source. He is the source. And living in this truth changes everything. Because then, when you receive the news that your current job is coming to an end, you don't fear because you know that even if the channel of provision changes, the source doesn't. So take this to heart. Find ways of cultivating that trust in the Father's love for you and his limitless resources. You can rest in him like Jesus did, trusting him as your source of everything you need in life, all your material needs. Give us this day our daily bread. But our daily bread represents more than just our material needs, important as they are. Let's have a look through our second window to learn from the master's example. Jesus nourished and strengthened his spirit by the word of God. You can exist by having your material needs met, but are you really living? As human beings made in the image of God, we have a yearning for fellowship and connection with our maker. Our spirits, the essential core of who we are, longs for God got that God-shaped hole that we talk about. Augustine famously said, our heart is restless until it rests in you. And how did Jesus satisfy this need of his to feed his spirit? First of all, by sending, spending time with his heavenly Father alone, because prayer is first and foremost about relationship. There's no way around this, folks. In your busy lives, you need to find time for that relationship to grow. Jesus would escape the crowds, often getting up early, finding a place alone where he could talk with his father freely by going into his own room or going out into the hills. But Jesus didn't only talk to and listen to his father. He fed his spirit by feeding on God's word because that's how his heavenly father would speak to him. And he did this by immersing himself in the scriptures. His daily bread was God's word. If the enemy of our souls attacks us and seeks, us to, seeks to separate us from the Father, seeks to undermine our trust in him and his love and provision for us, what's our defense? It's the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. And we can yield that with our spirit and with the help of the Holy Spirit. And what a powerful combination that is. The sword of the Spirit, the Word of God and the Holy Spirit. That changes things. And how did Jesus deal with his enemy, the devil, in the wilderness when they were engaged in close combat? It was by wielding God's Word, wasn't it? The devil said to him, if you are the son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. See the devil at work here, trying to undermine Jesus. He's got that barely disguised hint of accusation in the tone of his voice. If you are God's son, if he really cares for you. If he really loves that mu you that much, he'll do what you ask. He'll do what you command. He's prodding. He's testing Jesus. Maybe God's not going to provide your needs. Maybe you need to act on your own. See how he's trying to move Jesus 
out of a place of trust in his heavenly father and onto self-reliance. But Jesus retorts, wielding, it is written, what powerful words they are, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Deuteronomy 8.3 from the Old Testament. See, there lies the answer. You need more than material provision if you want to follow Jesus, if you want to walk with him, if you want to really live and not just merely exist. You need food which feeds your spirit. Every word that God speaks, every word carried on the spirit's breath. Give us this day our daily bread. And let's have a look through our third window to learn from the master's example. Jesus found greatest satisfaction in fulfilling his kingdom purpose. In John's Gospel, chapter 4, Jesus meets the Samaritan woman at the well. And through conversation, he gently reveals to her her real need, which was for living water from him and not just the physical H2O, H2O in the well. And then, and this is a bit of a comedy coming up, the disciples return from the town. They'd been buying food for lunch. And they urge him, Rabbi, eat. And Jesus replies, I have food to eat that you don't know about. Hmm. As usual, the disciples get a bit confused. Has he already had lunch? But Jesus replies, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. This was his daily bread. And he was inspired and energized at this point. He said, look, I tell you, lift up your eyes, I see and see that the fields are white for harvest because Jesus had seen in the spirit the new harvest that had just opened up among the Samaritans. Many of them were coming out to meet him because they'd heard what the woman had said as she returned into town. And Jesus stayed with them for another two days and many more believed. See, this is another side to God's provision. The word provision is in two parts. Pro means for and vision, provision. All of our provision for our material needs and our spiritual needs are feeding into this bigger purpose. Our food, our daily bread is in doing his will and seeing his kingdom come. Is it not? So the Lord will provide for you as you seek to further his kingdom. He'll provide for the vision. The master has work for you to do in his kingdom, a mission field of some kind, a people to reach, a people to serve, to minister to. That's a purpose for your life. That's a reason to live for the present time, an investment in the future. And as Jesus explains in the same passage, one sows and another reaps. Even Jesus couldn't do all the sowing or all the reaping. He needed his fellow workers, his disciples, not just the inner 12, but the 72 he set out, sent out on mission into the villages and his wider network of support. And then, of course, the church baptized and empowered by the Spirit of Pentecost. It's us. We're included in this. There's no way you can ful fulfill your purpose in God alone. It's a joint venture, a family business. No wonder we pray, give us our daily bread. So let's be inspired, energized, like Jesus, in seeing what God is doing among us. And let's find our greatest satisfaction 
in fulfilling God's purposes here. There's been much sowing into this fellowship in the past and reaping too. And now we're reaping a harvest from prayers prayed and seeds sown by many of you and many others in the past. But there is more. We want an increase, Lord. We're hungry for you. Your kingdom come, your will be done. So to wrap up, the provision we need from God, our daily bread, is about our material needs for day-to-day -day living, for food, clothing, a home, but it's more. It's about the deepest needs of our spirits to be nourished, strengthened, and to expand. But it's more. It is about finding our greatest satisfaction in seeking first his kingdom, finding our place in God's purposes in the world. Jesus is the master. He's our example. He's our example of kingdom living, a life built on prayer. But we don't want to be merely passive observers, just admiring this glorious view of Jesus through the windows. We want to inhabit that same world and step out into it through an open door, into everything that God has for us, to trust his loving Father in feeding on every morsel that come from, comes from God's mouth, in being partners, in seeing his Father's will accomplished on earth as in heaven, being part of that co-mission to rescue those in the world from the world. Jesus is our example, yes. He's our teacher, yes. He's our Lord and Master, and we're his apprentices, his disciples. In fact, he himself is our daily bread. He is our provision and our source. He's our nourishment. He's the bread of life. We feed on him, our daily bread. Let's pray. Father in heaven, give us this day and every day our daily bread, all that we need for life. Thank you for giving us your son who is our daily bread. We give him all the honor and glory. During this series, as we look closer at the Lord's Prayer, take us deeper, further into you. Grow in us a childlike trust. Increase our hunger for you. And inspire us with your vision. Amen.